Okay, let's begin. Welcome everybody to our fifth public lecture of 2022. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to announce that we've decided to keep our public lectures online for the rest of this term. Even though the restrictions are, as you all know, being loosened week by week, it's not clear that enough of our audience members would be comfortable shifting back to an in-person format for the last part of the, of the uh, offerings. Also, a hybrid format is not actually as easy to pull off as it might appear from the other side of the, uh, of the screen. So it also seems to us that our, our online format is working pretty well in these rather odd times. So we're gonna stick with it uh, for the rest of the term. Having said that, we are hoping to have a special in-person double header event on April 7th, featuring our two artists and residents uh, for the year and perhaps sharing some light refreshments among everybody who comes. So we'll keep you uh, informed about that special April event. Um, but uh, for now and then, uh, between now and then rather, we'll be together virtually. Now I'm very pleased to introduce you to Stacy Swain, a doctoral candidate from the Department of Political Science here at UVic. Stacy started her PhD in 2017 and during her time uh, in the program, she also completed a graduate certificate in Indigenous Nationhood at UVic in 2020. Before that, Stacy finished a B an MA in Religious Studies at the University of Ottawa in 2017 and a BA in Religious Studies and Anthropology from the University of Alberta in 2014. I'm extremely fortunate to be involved in her PhD committee where I worked with colleagues from law and political science to help her move through the program. To be honest though, she is so deeply immersed in religious studies, political science and indig indigenous legal and political orders that to be honest, she's uh, teaching all of us quite a lot. As I imagine you'll see today, her intellectual acumen is complemented really effectively by her commitment to frontline in-person social justice activism not just for Indigenous people, but for many others who often find themselves backed into a corner by unjust institutions and complex historical forces. Her sensitive reading of the ways legal, religious, and political discourses have been used both to support and to challenge unfair social arrangements is apparent not just in everything I've read from her, but in her critically constructive interventions in CSRS coffees and lectures and hallway conversations for the last couple of years. As many of you will know, I always try to integrate the territorial acknowledgement into my introductory remarks rather than have it as a standalone uh, statement. I try to do it in a way that shows the links between the scholars that we've invited to speak and the need for reconciliation with indigenous people. In some cases, as you can probably imagine, it's more of a challenge to do this with uh, than with others. In Stacy's case, the formal acknowledgement seems to perfectly echo her instincts and overall intellectual project. And so without further ado, I want to acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Please join me in welcoming Stacey Swain to the CSRS virtual stage. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, I will have to come back to this recording anytime I need a little confidence boost and listen to that introduction again. So. I really appreciate that. And I'm just gonna share my screen here so that my slideshow is visible. Is that visible for everyone? Get a thumbs up, perfect. Um, so I wanted to, of course, start by saying thank you for being here. Um, I'm really grateful to the CSRS for having me as a fellow this year. Um, and I'm also really grateful for the support of everyone who has made this talk possible. Um, those have been folks within the center, some of them here, of course, um, but also a lot of people who are outside of the center, but at the university or outside of the university altogether. Um, so without them, this talk, uh, things I'll be talking about wouldn't have been possible. Um, in terms of my slideshow, I just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, there's only one slide that's text heavy and the rest are kind of photos. Um, so please feel free to do whatever you need to do at 5 p.m. to keep somewhat awake, um, whether that be prepping dinner or folding laundry or caring for children or pets or looking at the screen. Um, I really don't mind. So um, with that, I wanted to begin by reflecting on what brought me as a Ukrainian British settler raised on Treaty 6 territory south of Edmonton, um, now a political science PhD candidate, 
to the dissertation project that I'm undertaking here on Lekwungen and Wasainich territories. Um, one of those things, as Paul uh, hinted at in his introduction, was that I traveled to Algonquin territory in 2015 to begin a master's degree in religious studies at the University of Ottawa. And when I think back to that, that time and to what I'm doing right now, a few key experiences were, I think, shaped what I'm engaged in now. So one of those things for me, um, as for so many other settlers, was, of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which had a profound impact upon my notion of Canada um, and my sense of what that meant in terms of how we understand the contemporary day. So that notion was deeply unsettled by the commission and the implications of its findings for today. Shortly after that, um, or secondly, shortly after I arrived in Ottawa, a fellow graduate student, Cam Montgomery, invited me to attend the release of the final report of the TRC with her and some Haudenosaunee and Kanyakahaka acquaintances. That day, we watched as elders opened the ceremony with prayer and song, and our new prime minister, who still remains today, shed tears as he accepted the government's responsibility for the harms caused. So over the course of my MA, my attention was absorbed by what seemed like an integration of Indigenous ceremony, prayer, song, smudging, the use of sacred items, into the public sphere, including political events and institutions. At the same time, I was learning about the ways in which the category of religion and its cognate notion of the secular were instrumental to imperial and colonial projects. This of course includes settler colonialism in Canada, which I understand as the dispossession of indigenous peoples from the land and the production of a new society on that land with indigenous nations either erased or perhaps recuperated if domesticated within settler discourses and structures. I began to understand what I was witnessing through Dene scholar Glenn Coulthard's formulation of the politics of recognition, in which indigenous peoples receive affirmative recognition from the sovereign state, but at the cost of being recognized as sovereign in themselves. And thirdly, and finally, right after I left Ottawa, I watched as a public expression of Indigenous ceremony seemed to refuse the politics of recognition and directly challenge Canadian sovereignty. So it was 2017. It was the sesquicentennial or 150th anniversary of Canadian Confederation. And following the TRC and movements like Idle No More, it was also a year the contestation of the Seleucid celebrations became a topic of public debate. That year, on the evening of June 28th, at the height of Canada 150, a movement called Reoccupation carried a disassembled teepee as they walked from the Canadian Human Rights Monument to the Parliamentary Precinct in Ottawa. Led by a coalition of Anishinaabek and Kanyakahaka youth, Reoccupation planned to, quote, reoccupy the traditional lands of the Algonquin people by raising a teepee and holding a four day public ceremony from which they plan to educate Canadians. Reoccupation was met by armed parliamentary security, surveilled by Ottawa police, as well as national intelligence services, and several participants were detained and issued with trespass notices. After a five hour standoff, reoccupation raised the teepee just inside the grounds, surrounded by metal, um, metal barricades. Their reception and mainstream media reports at the time evidence that reoccupation was initially perceived as an illegal protest at the center of Canadian governance. At best, an embarrassing interruption of patriotic sentiment, and at worst, a threat to public safety and national security. There is another frame, however, through which we can read reoccupation. And I also suggest other indigenous led ceremonial occupations. Instead of taking for granted that parliaments and legislatures comprise the center of politics, we might also consider parliament as a key site in the legal occupation of indigenous territories. 
And in fact, in 2017, the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation filed a land claim that has yet to be um, addressed that encompasses the parliamentary precinct and the land that the Supreme Court of Canada sits upon. This Canadian occupation, of course, makes its own claim to sovereignty on the foundation of Christian authority. The TRC, recognizing this, calls upon Canadian governments to repudiate the papal doctrine of discovery and the notion of terra nullius. I promise this is my only text heavy slide and I'm actually gonna pretty much read what it says. So uh, don't worry too much about following along. So as a 2022 BC Supreme Court decision states, Canadian jurisprudence has a long history of endorsing these doctrines. If the doctrines of discovery and terra nullius are indeed legally invalid or simply inapplicable in Canadian law, what then is the legal justification validating the assertion of crown sovereignty over indigenous peoples and indigenous lands? And so to quote this decision at length, regardless of any legal frailties underlying the Crown's assertion of sovereignty over British Columbia in 1846, the plaintiff's claim confronts certain harsh realities, unpalatable though they may be to many. First and foremost is the fact that the system of law and government imported by settlers into British Columbia and superimposed upon Indigenous peoples has become firmly and intractably entrenched. It is the foundation for Canadian society as it exists today. The laws relating to ownership of land are the basis for this country's wealth and the very foundation for its economy. It is these same laws which provide legitimacy to this court. And while the legal justification for crown sovereignty may well be debatable, its existence is undeniable and its continuation is certain. The second harsh reality, closely related to the first, is that this court is bound by the doctrine of precedent, which requires it to apply the law enunciated by the Supreme Court of Canada. If that construct or analytical framework attracts academic or political crit criticism, no matter how justified, this court is nevertheless bound to apply it. And that emphasis is my own. And so in highlighting this somewhat remarkable BC-based uh, um, decision and the passage from it, my aim is to reveal the extent to which even an institution that is key to stabilizing the Canadian state recognizes the questionable legitimacy of Canadian claims to sovereignty and its essential profit motive. Hence my language of Canada's illegal occupation. A central point that I wanna highlight here is how, as Heidi Stark argues, framing indigenous peoples as criminals has enabled settler colonial societies such as the US and Canada to avert attention from their own illegality. And so with these points in mind, for my talk today, and kind of in my broader work, I'd like to pose two key questions. The first is how can examining Indigenous-led ceremonial occupations add to an understanding of Indigenous ceremony more broadly? And secondly, what are the political implications of these expressions? To discuss these questions, I'm going to turn to a more recent and, um, at least for me, a more uh, nearby example. And the discussion that follows is primarily drawn from a forthcoming chapter in the volume Indigenous Spiritualities in Canada, um, which I also hope to adapt as a substantive chapter in my dissertation. So I'm going to begin with a description of the event, introduce you to some of the discourses at play, uh, discuss my approach to these discourses, and then conclude by returning to these questions. So the case study that I want to turn to is one that folks who were um, in Victoria two years ago might remember, uh, which is the one that became known as the ledge colloquially. And so actually on this very day two years ago, 
I was enjoying a brief respite in between the two periods of this other Indigenous youth-led ceremonial occupation, one that took place here in Lekwungen and Wasainich territories at the BC Provincial Legislature. Some people right, might remember this event happening within the broader movement that became known as Shutdown Canada. The youth that occupied the BC legislature were acting in response to a call for solidarity from the Wet'suwet'en hereditary leadership. Over the past two decades, members of Nunastoten camp had constructed a healing lodge, living quarters, and consent protocols in what's considered Northern BC along a road leading deep into Wet'suwet'en territory and crossing the Wet'suwet'en or Maurice River. The healing lodge and access points, including the Gidim Den checkpoint, stood in the path of the proposed Trans-Canada Pipelines Coastal Gas Link Pipeline, which would carry natural gas from the Perries to the coast. The pipeline was permitted by the provincial government and had negotiated impact benefit agreements with several Wet'suwet'en and Vance councils, but was refused by the chiefs that make up the hereditary leadership. Notably, it was also these hereditary leaders who had, alongside their traditional allies, the Gitsan, brought the case known as Delgamuk to the Supreme Court of Canada, in which the 1997 judgment defined and clarified Aboriginal title. So regardless of this legal recognition and apparent, an apparent lack of consensus within the Wet'suwet'en nation, when Unistoten Camp and Gidumden Checkpoint blocked access to their territories for the second time against this particular pipeline, Coastal GasLink obtained a provincial court injunction for construction to proceed. This led to a series of armed raids and arrests that were conducted by militarized Royal Canadian Mounted Police, accompanied by snipers and attack dogs, who cleared the area so workers could dismantle the camps. While some might see this as simply enforcing the Canadian rule of law, for others, this raid comprised an invasion of the Yinta or territory against Wet'suwet'en law. Galvanized by images of the raid and this call to shut down Canada, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people from sea to sea mobilized. The movement conducted port, railway, bridge, and border crossing blockades, highway marches and sit-ins in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en people. Indigenous youth played a central role in this wave of political action, with the most visible and sustained example being that of the Indigenous Youth for Wet'suwet'en at the BC Legislature. To begin what became known as the Ledge, near noon on February 6th, a contingent of Indigenous youth and supporters walked to the BC legislature and approached the steps that lead to the ceremonial entranceway. This entrance is traditionally reserved for members of the British Royal Family and representatives of the Crown. And in practice, the Lieutenant Governor uses the entranceway on events such as the speech from the throne for which they have a guard of honor and a 15 gun salute. With significantly less fanfare and no weaponry, the youth ran up the steps, stepped over the metal cord with a sign reading no entrance beyond this point, entered the limestone archway and reached the ornate metal gate that blocks access to the building itself. There the youth revealed their regalia and some donned the sleeping dragon mechanisms that you can see in the photo, which are plastic pipes that were covered in red, black and green fabric and blue. These read no CGL and land back with cedar branches tucked into the fabric and abalone buttons like those on coastal regalia shining from them. Over the next few hours, supporters delivered a metal fire pit and firewood and the sacred fire was lit. The ceremonial occupation had begun. While time doesn't allow me to give you a comprehensive description of events that took place from the 6th to 11th, and then again from the 24th to March 5th, I would, however, like to try to evoke sort of a sense of what the ceremonial occupation consisted of. The Indigenous youth were comprised by a fluctuating group of anywhere from six to 60 people under the archway 
and described themselves as an independent delegation of Indigenous youth from many nations. Hundreds of supporters contributed the large tents that you see there, sleeping gear, cooking and medical supplies, food and drinks, and other services. Volunteers organized and tracked these supplies, maintaining an online Google Doc to keep um, what the needs updated and ensured that the youth and supporters were fed, hydrated, and cared for. Other days, the youth would hold press conference, conferences and rallies that transformed into bridge and intersection blockades at times. On other days, the youth hosted movie nights, teach-ins, and an open mic, while artistic events included a funeral procession in which the youth echoed the Unistoten Camp's declaration that reconciliation is dead, dyed the legislature fountain red, and lit, lit the building in red using a projector. At the bottom of the steps, a large sign requested that people observe a number of protocols when in the space of the occupation to respect its ceremonial nature. Throughout the weeks, members of diverse Indigenous nations came to offer songs, drumming, prayers, and gifts. Red fabric wrapped the ornate metal lampposts and red dresses, which symbolized missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people, were suspended in the air above the youth. Cedar boughs were placed along the steps and railings for protection, and a carved and painted ancestral mask watched over the ceremony from atop the ceremonial gate. So I want to start by focusing on the discourse of the Indigenous youth. One sign that was featured prominently on the steps read, we're protecting, not protesting and highlights a key tension in how the events of the ledge were described and interpreted. For some, the ceremonial occupation could be reduced to an anti-pipeline protest. For others, however, the event constituted a stand for the very existence of Indigenous individuals and nations. So to consider this key difference, I examined the discursive gap that developed between the discourses of Indigenous youth Premier John Horgan and the Victoria Police Department. So starting with the youth, for 17 days in total, they transformed a site of colonial governments into a site in which indigenous ceremony was front and center. As their press release from February 7th described, we conduct our ceremony with sacred fire at the ceremonial entrance to the legislature in response to the ceremonial rites that are being denied and the sacred sites that are being desecrated in the name of industry. We are accountable to our more than human relations, future generations, the land and waters, and we require our traditional territories to conduct our law and ceremony and thus to continue to exist as indigenous peoples. They summarized their action we hold ceremony rooted in love to stand in solidarity with all land defenders. This long running conflict over land and the state's failure to respect indigenous people's jurisdiction over their territories was at the center of the youth's discourse. A prominent banner hung over the ceremonial gate read, they stole the children from the land, now they steal the land from the children. Further, the February 7th press release emphasizes, as Indigenous youth, we stand with the Wet'suwet'en Nation's assertion of sovereignty because we understand that Indigenous peoples will cease to exist without our land. Our languages, cultures, and future generations cannot survive without it. Alongside all eyes on Wet'suwet'en and shut down Canada, land back was taken up as a slogan, chant, and social media hashtag and that's washable chalk, don't worry. In brief, land back refers to the land itself being returned to indigenous peoples, but it also means much more to those who understand themselves as constituted through the land. As an editorial introduction to the land back issue of Briar Patch Magazine reads, we want the system that is land to be alive so that it can perpetuate itself and perpetuate us as an extension of itself. That's what we want back. 
our place in keeping land alive and spiritually connected. Thus, land back invokes the interconnected body of laws, principles, and practices that constitute diverse Indigenous nations and their land-based governance systems. The Indigenous youth for Wet'suwet'en also highlighted the negative impacts that colonial governance and extractive industries have had. As their press release continues, Indigenous youth are not only inheriting a climate crisis driven by fossil fuel projects like CGL, but Canada's legacy of colonization, genocide, and gendered violence against Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people. In protecting the lands from industrial development, we are protecting our bodies from violence. Viewed in this light, the ceremonial, ceremonial occupation was not only a form of resistance, but an urgent act of protection tied to Indigenous sovereignty, identity, and law. As Jen Wickham of Gidamton Camp explains, Anuk no Akten, or what's so in law, is not a belief or a point of view. It is a way of sustainably managing our territories and relations with one another and the world around us, and it has worked for millennia to keep our territories intact. Our law is central to our identity. The ongoing criminalization of our laws by Canada's courts and industrial police is an attempt at genocide, an attempt to extinguish Wet'suwet'en identity itself. And in Victoria, Gitsan youth Colin Sutherland Wilson echoed these sentiments when he declared that it was his responsibility to act in solidarity with Wet'suwet'en hereditary leadership. He described to the media, the Wet'suwet'en aren't anti-pipeline protesters. They are a sovereign nation upholding their laws. And further, in this day and age, it is immoral, it is unjust, and it is inhumane for Canada to continue to criminalize and vilify Indigenous law. Despite such statements, and the sentiments that the Indigenous youth for Wet'suwet'en expressed, their concerns were not recognized by the BC Premier, John Horgan. Throughout the 17-day occupation, there was a single official statement issued. The Premier's statement on protest activity, as it was titled, makes reference to reconciliation as a shared project that does not begin or end with a single decision, event, or moment perhaps a veiled response to the movement's assertion that reconciliation is dead. This statement was released from the office of the Premier on February 11th, following the interruption of the throne speech, an event that I will expand upon. On that day, the ceremonial occupation blocked at least 16 entrances into the legislature. Indigenous youth and supporters drummed, sang, and linked arms across the doorways. Despite this, some MLAs and media jumped into stairwells, while security officials physically forced others through the press of bodies that were sandwiched in between the limestone entrances. In what was considered a victory for the movement, the Governor General's own ceremonial entrance was prevented. When Premier Horgan cancelled the press conference scheduled to follow the throne speech, he held one the next day instead. At this, and I quote from it throughout this paragraph, he apologized to those who were just trying to do their jobs, but were in some cases dragged up the stairs to get up into the building, alongside repeated assurances that the CGL pipeline would be built. Horgan called the events on throne speech day unacceptable, while calling the challenges of the group just plain wrong. Horgan reports hearing shut down Canada from those people outside through his window and declared his lack of support for such sentiments, citing an overwhelming majority of Indigenous peoples who are anxious for the prosperity that other British Columbians have experienced over the last 150 years. Horgan averred that he will not allow the massive Wet'suwet'en movement to get in the way of moving forward on what he believes is in the best interests of British Columbia and the long term. While the Premier's position dismisses the Indigenous youth for Wet'suwet'en's concerns, his position is perhaps most evident when he refers to that mob outside during a question period in the Legislative Assembly in early March. <laughs> 
In the book chapter, I also consider how security forces engaged with the ledge. Indigenous youth and supporters were visibly surveilled by officers of the Victoria Police Department, as well as the Legislative Assembly Protective Services, which at the time was entirely comprised of former police officers. The Vic PD published a total of nine related news releases, which only refer to the event and those involved as a protest and protesters. The first three concern the day of the throne speech and allege that members of the public were assaulted and injured while calling for victims and witnesses to come forward. Other witnesses that day contest the use of the term assault, including a body of volunteers known as Legal Observers Victoria. On Facebook and Instagram, they released a statement saying that the Indigenous youth and their representatives communicated regularly to supporters to stay peaceful, abide by police requests, and refrain from engaging in violence. Notes, videos, and personal recollections of legal observers do not corroborate claims that supporters committed assault. Media also reports that two complaints about police misconduct were filed that day. And in contrast, several police news releases imply that protesters were not being peaceful and emphasize that the police's primary job is to protect public safety and ensure that protests are safe, peaceful, and lawful. I suggest that these discourses attempt to foreclose the explanations of Indigenous youth and their emphasis on Indigenous law. The news releases of the Vic PD present a narrative in which the police, despite being the only people present with physical weapons and wielding a monopoly on state sanctioned violence, construct themselves as the protectors of public safety against unreasonable, violent, and unruly protesters an impression supported by the comments of the Premier. A final Vic PD press release mentions the ceremonial occupation some months later and summarizes the cost of policing public rallies, marches, and other such events more broadly. What this quantitative data does not address, however, are the costs that the Indigenous youth for Wet'suwet'en were attempting to highlight those of colonial and capitalist violence and the safety of Indigenous peoples, their lands and relationships. As Indigenous youth for what so it encountered, the parallels between today's state violence and Canada's history with Indigenous nations leads us to question if the era of reconciliation differs that greatly from the eras of residential schooling and potlatch bans. So when considering the discourse of the youth, the premier, and police, there is a clear disjunct in how they characterize the ceremonial occupation as an act of protection versus one of protest. Against the latter, the ceremonial occupation produced a space in which to assert and embody a notion of Indigenous sovereignty. In the discourse above, the youth express this notion as a legal obligation and political responsibility stemming from the identities and relationships that they inhabit as Indigenous youth from many nations, including nations that are connected to each other through diplomatic alliances and networks of other than human relatives, as well as histories of resistance. In sum, while the ceremonial occupation was indeed an example of resistance to colonial governments, it was not lawless or disorderly, but rather centered Indigenous legal orders. Without understanding the perspective of Indigenous youth and those engaged in land defense, public understandings of such events can not only be impoverished, but also miss an opportunity to see beyond the colonial logics that entrap politics in the contemporary era. Considering how public expressions of Indigenous ceremony can be understood as a mode of political praxis allows for this lack to be remedied. So this is where I'm going to get a bit theoretical. I apologize, it's this late in the presentation. But in reference to Indigenous ceremony, the terminology of the sacred and the spiritual have become prominent in both popular and academic discourse. Scholars often consider who deploys such concepts and categories, the context in which they occur, and how they are received. <clears throat> 
For example, anthropologist David Walsh analyzes differences in the language that Dene people use across contexts. Walsh points out that Dene leaders speaking in public contexts invoke terms such as spirituality and the sacred in order to draw connections between people, animals such as caribou, and a Dene sense of identity, but in more intimate, intimate and interpersonal contexts with extended family, such terms would be askewed for specific concepts within the Dene language that describe personal environmental relationships. Walsh uses the language of macro level discourses versus micro level discourses to discuss each tendency in turn, with one example of the former, the macro level discourses being the I don't know more movement. The ceremonial occupation that I just described has obvious resonance with Idle No More, which was famous for its large scale public round dances, as well as with reoccupation in Ottawa. The movements were led by Indigenous peoples from diverse nations who described their actions as ceremonial. In all of these cases, ceremony became a sort of macro category for a mode of practice that was not only disruptive of colonial capitalism but also generative. The ceremonies not only contested power, but also circulated power between a multiplicity of political actors and orders beyond the state. At the same time, by referencing social relationships with other than human relatives and the land, the discourse of the indigenous youth for Wet'suwet'en seems to blur the lines between these ideas of macro versus micro discourse. To my mind, the challenge then becomes attending to where and how these discursive spheres converge. How can we, and I mean we in a more general sense beyond the academy, understand public expressions of Indigenous ceremony not solely as oppositional to colonization, but as also articulating the relevance of Indigenous legal orders and the ongoing vitality of the extended kin relations within their Indigenous political orders? To address these questions, I turn to the Indigenous nationhood literature. In particular, David Delgado Shorter and Dakota scholar Kim Talbert problematized the reduction of Indigenous ontologies and epistemologies and the relationships entailed to a dematerialized and depoliticized spirituality. As Shorter notes somewhat pointedly, if Indigenous peoples are thought of as spiritual, then there is no need to attend to their material needs and actual claims. Further, the term spirituality can reduce Indigenous traditions and land claims to sacred matters instead of rational knowledge. While the notion of the sacred can be useful for its rhetorical force, its overemphasis can also lead to the romanticization of Indigenous peoples at the expense of recognizing their political authority. For example, Cheyenne McAllister recounts how settler activists in the Stein Valley embraced its Inkpatmuk name Stryan, which translates to hidden place, pointing to the irony of the hidden place being protected as a public park. McAllister highlights how an emphasis on the sacredness of the area became another way to disconnect the people from the place. Modern notions of spirituality and the sacred objectified and reified such that they can be decontextualized from people in place, can easily lend themselves to colonial appropriation and capitalist commodification. In contrast, Shorter suggests that we understand spiritual as conveying a sense of the related or intersubjective. Building on this, Talbert proposes to resist objectivating the intersubjective and understand spirituality as an aspect of human relational activities in which people assert, exchange, and reciprocate power as well as material sustenance. By relational in this context, Talbert is referring to an extended and expansive practice of kinship. Most importantly, this theoretical intervention not only resists colonial capitalist logics of containment, but also calls attention to being in good relationship with, to making kin, and with less monitoring and regulation of categories. 
resonating with what was what has become known as a relational approach within indigenous nationhood literature. It is important to note that these relationships are not meant to be extracted from place, power, or consequences. Further, this concentric approach, I think, is central to the political projects conducted by land defenders and water protectors that get characterized as Indigenous resurgence. Indigenous resurgence can be understood as a form of mobilization and practice that upholds and renews the legal and political responsibilities that flow from the historical and ongoing relationships that Indigenous nations have with place, people, and other than human beings. As Nicholas Claxton and John Price describe how Indigenous governance is grounded in, quote, spiritual and legal beliefs founded on an organic sense of being in which people do not own the earth, but rather belong to it. Similarly, as Anishinaabe author and journalist Tanya Talega wrote in support of the Shutdown Canada movement, Indigenous people are the land. It provides us with language, ceremony, ceremony, food. The land gives us a sense of belonging, tells us who we are. As the discourse of Indigenous youth for what Soden attests to, attacks upon the land can be understood as attacks upon the people. The language of land defenders and water protectors, therefore, highlights this relationship of belonging and reciprocal obligation, as well as emphasizing the profoundly political and material dimension that these spiritual and legal beliefs can have. This interpretation fits well with the approach to sacred and spirituality as intersubjective relations or as human relational activities through which power circulates. Building on this, I suggest that ceremony as a mode of political practice can be understood as an integral aspect of Indigenous resurgence. <clears throat> So to understand, or sorry, to return to the second question that I raised earlier, with these points borne in mind, what are the broader political implications of public expressions of indigenous ceremony? As the court decision that I cited earlier outlined, the foundation for Canadian society as it exists today are the laws and system of government imported by European settlers. More specifically, laws relating to the ownership of land as the basis for Canadian wealth and the economy. And these same laws grant legitimacy to the court. While the judge goes on to say that the continuation of Canadian sovereignty is both a harsh reality and a certainty, throughout Canadian history, and I think with these examples, we have seen the sheer number of material and ideologic, uh, ideological resources that the settler state requires in order to deflect attention away from its own illegality. One such technique is to do so by surveilling and criminalizing indigenous ceremony, or conversely attempting to reappropriate those ceremonies in ways that shore up the colonial edifice. An approach to indigenous ceremony informed by the resurgence paradigm, however, enables a more nuanced consideration of the power relations and dynamics at play. In short, as Jeff Corntassel describes, resurgence is about regenerating indigenous lifeways, relational responsibilities and sustainable pathways. So as to approach engagements with states and other actors from a strength-based strength perspective. So while many of these land-based governance systems have been interrupted, likewise, many of them are being revitalized, both in theory and practice. Within these projects, spirituality and ceremony can be understood as always already power-laden modes of interacting with other humans and other than human beings. Grounded in understandings of interdependence and responsibility, the relations of Indigenous resurgence present challenges and alternatives to colonial capitalist politics. As Gitsan youth Gina Moet reflected one year after the ceremonial occupation, the time of reckoning for colonial systems is far from over. Rather, the legislature was one tiny little step in moving to a different way of being, a different world. And so to conclude, the purpose of my research, as I see it, 
is not to idealize or romanticize indigenous resurgence movements or suggest that they're devoid of power relations and dynamics in themselves. But I do hope, however, to suggest that public expressions of indigenous ceremony can draw attention to and engage us within a politics of interdependence. One that, given the current harsh realities, so to speak, that broader society is facing, appears both urgent and necessary. The political implications of public expressions of Indigenous ceremony, therefore, are important to engage with, um, partly, of course, in relation to Indigenous sovereignty and nationhood, but, but perhaps also to reorient us within and perhaps broaden the horizon of political possibility. Thank you. Thanks very much, Stacey. Hard, hard for you to hear our clapping, but we, we're all doing good. Well. So thanks very much. Just unshare your screen. Wonderful. Great. So we have about uh, 15 minutes or so for some questions and, and comments. Um, the chat is also now uh, enabled. So if you want to put your question in the chat, you can do that. And then if th that's only if you don't want to ask it out loud, because if you do want to ask it out loud, please raise your hand and get our attention and we'll put you in the queue. Stacy, I wonder, I don't see any hands, so I wonder if you could give us a sense. Oh, Dominique, go ahead. Mm. You... Oh, oh, you did. Scott, I think she's still. Hang on. For security purposes, Dominique, we, we make this kind of, there we go. So if, uh... Yeah, I'll just, if people can raise their hands via the reactions, it's easier for me to locate you than to unmute you. So Dominique, could you try to unmute yourself? No, it's not working, Scott. Uh, okay, now it's working. Okay. It's, uh, many thanks, Stacey, for your presentation. I thought it was really great, extremely interesting. And I think that it's what's fascinating in Canada is to see how um, the state, the Canadian state, uh, uses, uh, likes to use Indigenous ceremony when it suits it. Um, and here we have a very different uh, uh, happening, you know, because now it is the protesters who are using ceremony. And, um, and of course, for very different purposes. And um, it seems to me that, and what is what I found particularly uh, interesting in your presentation uh, is that it is true that there is always the possibility of, uh, let's say, make the reference to ceremony uh, uh, less threatening by portraying it as simply spiritual in a sense, in our sense of, let's say, religious, mm -hmm. uh, whereas, uh, in the indigenous uh, conception of, of the law, uh, as Burroughs says, the sacred, the natural, uh, the deliberative, and the customary law are layered. So you can't simply separate them and, and reify, let's say, one dimension. So um, I just wanted to, to hear a little bit more from you on how you would contrast this, the different uses of ceremony uh, in Canadian politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think actually thinking about some of those uh, tensions is really what kind of drew my interest into this kind of project, actually, <clears throat> um, which was kind of the, I guess, tension in the sense that particularly when the state was very like overtly physically repressive, um, there was an incentive for, and I say that as if it's, you know, obviously that's ongoing in the cases I'm talking about, <laughs> um, but there was an incentive for indigenous people to potentially portray um, what they were doing, their ceremonies as um, merely cultural or merely spiritual or religious, um, because in that way it wouldn't become, didn't have the same sort of political threat potential 
um, or economic function as um, it would within Indigenous people's own understandings of what they were doing. And I think that when I'm looking at these examples now and the kind of tension between the sort of integration and recognition versus um, the protests that I'm looking at, I find it really important to recognize that there is an incentive to present these things in particular ways um, and through particular concepts and ideas, but also recognize that when Indigenous people do that, not necessarily assuming that the state's sort of attempt to contain and control those ceremonies are completely successful. Um, like, I think that a more complex understanding of power kind of can recognize that there is this incentive, but also recognize that um, particular, that for Indigenous peoples to like use and claim that space for their own purposes is also an act of power. Um, so I think in my work, I'm always just kind of trying to navigate that tension between um, those sort of ideas and the kind of notions um, of like culture and religion and law and politics and what they sort of connote, I guess. Thanks. I wonder if, if I could ask a, a kind of a methodological question, Stacey, about you and you and your work. How do you position yourself in this conversation? Because it, there, it, there must be a temptation um, that you would have to resist to participate in a kind of a romanticization of the claims, right? A, a kind of a naturalization of the claims, even though you as a critical scholar of religion and spirituality and politics know the way these, these things are used kind of um, opportunistically often and strategically. So you know that abstractly as, a, as an intellectual, and yet you have a certain sympathy for the political payoff that is sometimes attached to doing that. So how do you manage that tension? That must be difficult. Um, yeah, for sure. I definitely struggle with that. <laughs> um, I think that in terms of how I think about it, something that was kind of interesting, particularly when I moved from Ottawa, where I wasn't really embedded in a community that was doing um, these types of things, to uh, Victoria, where I kind of, within like six months or so was actually, uh, four years ago was the first time I occupied a fish farm um, in support of Kwakwakiwak resistance. I just got back today, four years ago, according to um, my Facebook memories <laughs> and a friend's kind reminder. But um, when I started participating in these kinds of events, I actually really tried to sort of suspend my sort of, inclination to just see everything as I don't know rhetorical and as like sort of like a rhetorical trick or something like that um and I still try to really like attend to the ways that discourse has power um I think that's really central to my work but I was also a little bit suspicious of the way that that kind of approach might lead me to dismiss kind of types of knowledge and like epistemological or ontological claims um, because I was so firmly schooled literally in this particular type of approach. So um, I think I'm still working on that all the time basically. And I will have to meth figure out how to talk about it in the dissertation itself. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard, but you do it. You've you've done a really good job. Um, Paige, you had a question in the in the chat. I'm not sure if you wanted to ask it uh, directly. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Stacy. That was so interesting. Um, my question, you know, I, I was thinking about the word spiritual and how secularized that word has become, particularly, I think on the West Coast, right? It's being used for everything from makeup to t-shirts to getaways. And I'm wondering if, that, if the secularization of that word and that concept spiritual has had a negative impact on 
indigenous ceremony and or spirituality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I think I can only speak to examples that I've observed that have um, reached either media or um, that I've been, you know, party to for some reason or another, um, obviously. So I think that, yes, it has. Um, like a really kind of interesting case study, I think, actually would be a conflict a few years ago about the sort of appropriation of the woodland style of art, mm -hmm. um, which does have a element of sort of spiritual practice. It's associated with a particular place and nation. Um, but because things that are sort of spiritual are, you know, sometimes considered up for grabs for this sort of capital, you know, commodification, mm -hmm. um, it was sort of assumed that, you know, it was appropriated by white settlers. And so I think that that's kind of one example of how um, the sort of I don't know, entrapment of spirituality as a notion um, within the sort of logics of colonialism and capitalism um, mm. does have this negative impact. Mm. Yeah, so, and actually I think, the, I think the commodification of spirituality is actually probably better terminology than the secularization of the term spirituality. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's a text by Rich King and Jeremy Carete that I'm meaning to get and pick up called Selling Spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, it's a few years old, but I think that's one that I'll be citing. Awesome, thanks. Stacey, could you tell us a little bit about how that protest slash protection um, event ended? And I asked that question because I'm kind of amazed you got through that whole lecture without saying anything about what's happening in Ottawa and, or, and anything about what happened two weeks after that some of those pictures were taken, right? So that's when COVID arrived. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's funny when I see pictures like that with people without masks, I think, what are they thinking? But of course the world changed only two weeks later, roughly. Yeah. Uh, because I, I remember um, talking with lots of people in, in that movement about their experiences and then all of a sudden the world shut down. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how this, the state or the police forces interacted with, with that community versus what you're seeing nationwide now around protests because in some in some respects you could see some similarities uh, except in the in the Ottawa context it's kind of like Christian religiosity that's being invoked more often and uh, a dramatic state not quite tolerance exactly but some kind of different approach than what you've what you've seen and I know you've talked about this before so I wonder if that could be mm. something you could tease out. Yeah, so the two temptations that I had to resist when I was preparing this talk was one, talking about what's happening right now, and two, uh, talking about, I don't know, making some like before COVID jokes, basically. <laughs> so I think that um, it is really interesting, and I actually am hoping to kind of talk a bit about the movement right now in the dissertation. And I think what's really important to bring out is the contrast in the sense that it is police officers and parliamentary security that are in some senses organizing some of these protests um, that are happening right now, Ottawa in particular. Um, so in my mind, it's actually not really surprising that there is an alignment of the state with a movement that um, is essentially in favor of sort of a, the colonial capitalist status quo, basically, that the, there's this sort of like idea that freedom means um, you get to do whatever you want, regardless of whether it hurts other people. Um, so, I kind of think of what's happening right now as actually an extension of the same kind of logics that you see when um, John Horgan, for example, talks about people just wanting to do their jobs um, or the police officers that they would say at the ledge, for example, like, oh, well, we're just doing our job. Um, so this kind of sense of, I think, um, 
what Eileen Ward and Robinson might call the white possessive or this sort of sense of entitlement, um, I think is one that's a really sort of core issue within our current society that I kind of hope talking about this stuff hopes me get at a little bit in some ways. Yeah. Yeah, when I, when I saw the pictures that you showed of the the police car kind of with the bumper right up against the protesters, I had, it really did bring to mind things we're seeing every day now. So thanks very much for those reflections. Um, I wonder if we could see the slide, Talia, for the next um, one. And while, while you're uh, putting that up, um, please join me in, in uh, thanking Stacy for a fabulous uh, lecture. Um, next week is reading week, as many of you will know. So there's no lecture next week, next Thursday. But the following Thursday, we have a special event. It's one of our John Albert Hall sort of extended uh, events. And it's going to be uh, on Zoom. It was going to be in person, but we've uh, opted to do it on Zoom with Sephora Berman, DeAndre Smiles, and Christiana Zenner. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, watershed moments, spirituality, forests, and fresh water. There will be actually some obvious overlap between some of the themes Stacy teased out today and the issues that are going to show up in this conversation for sure. So if, if you liked today, come, uh, come in a couple of weeks and we'll kind of continue some of these conversations. So again, just please join me in, in thanking Stacy.